Okay, hey everybody, Austin Meyer. If I seem slightly annoyed, this is because it's our third take at this due to microphone problems, grr. But anyway, uh, coming at you from uh, Mike's Playhouse, X-Force PC, and today we are looking at the honeycomb yoke, which I guess people want to hear about because it's really not out yet, and Mike managed to get one uh, for me to take a look at. So, um, I can kind of sort of cut to the chase. It's freaking awesome. It's the best yoke I've ever used, hands down, period. Nothing else comes close. If you want the details, continue to watch the video. So here we go. When you first um, look at the thing, what you notice is every bit of the shape is so carefully molded and crafted, where it has this kind of round feel uh, around the back here and then flat on the top with a matte finish and it's so solid you can't even tell if it's plastic or metal with some rubber on top you can't even tell what it is um it's so carefully uh textured and manufactured and shaped and feel uh the yoke itself it's got this wonderful matte finish this absolutely beautiful and then they go up to a glossy uh, plastic feel up uh, on the horns, the top of the horns of the yoke where your thumbs go and where the switches are. Um, the feel of the yoke is just absolutely, basically the same as the real airplane. Um, it's got uh, metal uh, hardware that's clearly really firmly mounted uh, back in here. There's like almost no play, certainly no more play than there is in a real yoke. Um, and it's, you can really feel the, the rollers just doing a perfect job of uh, supporting the yoke as it goes through its full range of travel. Um, the range of travel is, I'd say it's similar to what you'd find for a Cessna 152, which is a small, small airplane. Um, the resistance is probably similar to what you'd feel in a 152 at kind of low, at low speed, maybe a Cessna 152 at 70 knots or something like that. Kind of s small hardware, small travel, low uh, resistance. So definitely uh, aimed more at the really, really small, slower moving airplanes. Um, the larger, heavier airplanes have a much larger yoke with larger control travel and, and larger forces. Uh, so this is definitely Im simulating the small end um, of the aircraft. Uh, the yoke has got great travel. It goes all the way through 90 degrees. Um, the, it's a little light little light maybe on the resistance but uh it's not gonna it's not light enough to really hurt your your sim flying uh, pleasure or training i don't think it has a uh, a plethora of switches on the top so let's just take a quick look at those uh all right so mike these are elevator trim all right this is like take three so mike you already know the answer to this question but just pretend you don't okay. why are there two buttons to do the elevator trim why is the elevator trim done with two buttons safety Safety. Okay, can you say, can you, would you have guessed an hour ago what the safety benefit was to having two switches to do the elevator trim? Uh, if I'd have had like a minute or two to think about it, I would have. Uh, right. Not like, you know, on the spot. Not instantly. instantly. Oh, 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 quick, quick thing for the YouTube commenters. The YouTube commenters will say, why doesn't Mike have his own microphone? And the answer is he did, and that's what screwed up our audio and why we are doing the third take now. So Mike is still going to continue to yell from the background. Um, so uh, the elevator trim is controlled by these, and here's the interesting thing. You have to move both of them at once in the real airplane to get the elevator trim to move. And the reason is an elevator trim runaway is probably the worst thing that can happen in an airplane. So Mike, why is an elevator trim runaway the worst thing that can happen? Nobody talks about it as a failure, but it's still critically dangerous. Well, why do you think uh, that is? It's trying to force the plane, uh, well, either up or down. So right. you're going to stall or you're going to you know, make a crater in the ground. Right. I call it face planting. That's my technical term. If it runs up, you're going to stall. If it runs down, you're going to face plant. Now, let's just say that you, the trim were to run up towards the stall. If you're a pilot, what would you do at that point? If the trim starts to push the and are you going to succeed? Will right you down. succeed in pushing the nose down? Um, probably not. I mean, you would have. Some I disagree. I disagree. Some success. You'll have more than you think, and here's why. Well, it the depends on what's doing it. If it's mechanical or a computer. Let's say it's a trim runaway. Let's say the trim just goes and it runs away full trim up. I would think that the little flap of trim, uh -huh. isn't it a little flap? On, on light airplanes it is, yeah. Yeah, that you'd be able to work against that. Exactly. Enough. Exactly. You can overpower it. Yeah. Because as the nose comes up and the speed deteriorates, as the speed deteriorates, that little tab becomes kind of weak compared to my forearms. 
right? I mean, compared to my physical strength to move a thing, that little tab kind of becomes weak as, the, as this, the airplane nose comes up, the speed comes down, you're coming down to you know, maybe 70 knots, 80 knots, 60 knots, whatever the stall speed is. The airflow has gotten weak enough over that little tab just due to low forces, due to low speed. Yeah, you can overcome it. What if it runs away down? Well, you see, I would think you could do to overcome it as well, but apparently mm -hmm. by your body language, you can't. <laughs> because what happens when the nose of the airplane comes down? Oh, it's going faster, so there's more and force on Exactly, the exactly. As in you, when it comes down, the airplane builds up speed. As the airplane builds up speed, the forces... The tab becomes more effective. Exactly. And it will absolutely, on certain airplanes at certain speeds, exceed human ability to bench press the yoke. <laughs> so a trim runaway nose down is basically about the worst thing that can happen in an airplane. Um, so what they do to try and make it safe is uh, to avoid one little wire like shorting out inside the yoke and, and commanding a, a nose down trim, you have to, to do two wires. So, uh, yeah, or two wires would have to short out to make the trim run down. Oh, it reminds me of a Saturday Night Live skit. Someone was pretending to be Sam Donaldson and did you ever see the, the skit where it was like Phil Hartman or something pretending to be Sam Donaldson? He's like, and look, we're alive. He was, he was uh, okay, well, it was Saturday Night Live, and he was satirizing some news show that was so, they were constantly bragging about how they were live. He's like, we're alive, and you can tell we're alive because my watch shows what time it really is. Now, you might be thinking, what if I set the watch to the time that the show would be broadcast? Well, what would you say to... Two watches. <laughs> so, you know, you're not going to, you can't set two watches into the future, right? So it's the same thing with the elevator trim. You might have one wire short out and cause a nose down trim run away, but you're probably going to have two wires short out at the same time. And that's what it would take to cause the, the trim to run down. So um, they, the real airplanes have this and the honeycomb yoke does as well. Uh, minor problem. X-Plane doesn't, right? X-Plane does not have the concept of, a, of an A trim and a B trim where they both have to be engaged to make the trim go. So we have now seen a case where the hardware has exceeded the software. And so uh, just like I did with the Xavion weight turbulence where we discovered in the middle of one of my presentations I needed to improve it and then I did. That's 1140 beta 1. Well, I guess we know what's coming to explain 1140 beta 2, don't we? Um, I'm going to have an A trim and a B trim. So you'll hook one of these up to elevator A trim, one of these up to elevator B trim. And then if they're both activated together, that's what it'll take to make the trim go. And so we'll have the same safety factor here that we have in the real airplane. But what about Which, current customers that only have a single trim? Are you going to automatically... Oh no, they're all done with that plane. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Let me think about that when I'm not in the middle of a YouTube presentation. Right, okay. I'll come up with a way so their stuff also works, but you can hook up an A trim and a B trim. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll make it so there's an A trim and a B trim, and, and if both the A trim and B trim are received at the same time, boom, it'll just send out the standard trim command. You see? And so these both move at the same time will be the same as just having one of these on a yoke. And then people will be less likely to crash their simulators if a wire breaks under the switch. I, I might save one simulator crash over the next 10 years. So, you know how devastating those are. Yeah, I know how devastating those are. So, uh, so at any rate, um, I will improve X-Plane. This is the way I approach life. If I can see anyone else raise their game, I'm like, oh yeah, you raised that game. Now I'm gonna try and come up to your level and exceed it. And the Honeycomb guys have done a great job of, of raising the bar and I'm gonna meet them. That's something to do, I'm gonna meet them. I'm, I'm honored to work with somebody that does a better job than me. So um, I'll add the A trim and B trim to X-Plane. Uh, over here, we've got lateral trim. And uh, what we've done is we have set uh, the, the, like the bottom one to aileron and the upper one to rudder. Now this is a little wonky because what we really probably should do is have an aileron A and an aileron B. Um, but I feel like having an aileron trim and a rudder trim instead. I, I might do a feature where there's an aileron A and aileron B and rudder A and rudder B, but that may be a little overkill. We'll see. I'm going to see if I can find any airplanes that actually have this before I, before I take any action. Um, so a plethora of buttons. Oh yeah, and then up here, you've got this little thingamabob to move the view around. Now real airplanes, if they have a switch like this, this is usually used to do trim, but because we have these guys set up to do trim, we can use this to move your head around. So this is technically not realistic, but who cares? It lets you move your head around and look around the cockpit. And in the real airplane, 
I actually can move my head around and look around the cockpit. So it's nice to be able to do that here uh, with this little switch. Um, then we have these little guys here, alternator, battery, uh, avionics bus, and every single light on the airplane. And then over here on the right, ignition. Okay, so I said the yoke is awesome. I've shown the buttons. Uh, we said this is the honeycomb. Um, oh, let's talk about the company just a tiny little bit here real quickly. Uh, they are based at um, Montgomery Field, San Diego. And Montgomery Field, San Diego is a little bit of a special place for me uh, because it's where I took my first instrument currency check. And I had a hell of a time trying to pass the instrument currency check. I had to go up four times. Um, before I uh, finally could get the sign off. And I was so annoyed at having to go up four times to get my instrument currency sign off that I said, well, I'm never gonna go through that crap again. I'm gonna be prepared next time. That was when I wrote X-Plane. That, that was what caused me to first say, I need to write myself a flight sim. And this was back in 1993, maybe, no, yeah, I think 1993, 1992. So uh, Montgomery Field uh, is where the X-Plane journey started for me. And uh, it's where Honeycomb is based with their uh, awesome yoke as well. Um, why don't we go, oh, 250 bucks. You want to talk about pricing? Okay, Mike, just what, what you yeah, want to say? Yeah, two, I was going to say the Logitech you'd want to talk about next. Oh, okay. Comparison. But yeah, 250 is the right 250 price. bucks. Uh, when Mike first told me it was $250, he said, now, I know that's expensive. But to me, it does not seem expensive considering how amazing it is. It doesn't seem expensive at all considering its awesomeness. Um, over here, who makes this thing over here? Logitech. The Logitech. All right, the Logitech is, uh, it's like I never even want to touch it again after having used the honeycomb. It's high friction. It feels like it's not, you know, uh, sliding smoothly. It's very snappy back Yeah, it kind of just pops and jerks around. It only goes 45 degrees, which is ridiculous. You can't get any precision in your roll input, right? You can't get precision in your roll input if you don't even move it very far. You have to have a large travel to get precision close in. It only makes sense, right? And they, they don't have it here. The real yoke in a real airplane absolutely goes to 90 degrees, uh, more or less. I'm sure a YouTube commenter will show some unusual case, but it's almost always right around 90 degrees for a real airplane. Um, so uh, yeah, there's not enough travel to be precise. It's light, it's plasticky, it's high friction. It doesn't feel like a real airplane. Uh, and I've always just assumed that these kind of, well, frankly, somewhat low quality yokes were our lot in life as flight simmers. And the Honeycomb guys have proven that wrong. They've proven that assumption to be out of date by showing the simulator can feel just as good as the real airplane. And frankly, just as good as a new airplane, not a used one. <laughs> so, um, just just amazing job um 250 bucks and uh but, but when are they gonna start shipping them in quantity they don't ship them in quantity uh, yet i think it's around october 1st oh oh that's coming up there's a lot of pre-orders that are sold out so if you don't right. have a pre-order in you know you might be looking at a month or two after that right if you if you try to right now the pre-orders are sold out so if you yeah. haven't gotten in you know, you're probably looking at more like November would be my guess. Right. I'm guessing. Yeah. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, why don't we do a quick setup here? Uh, same as always. Next one, you go up here to the little thing on the right. You choose. So this is done alpha flight controls. I would expect it to say honeycomb yoke, not alpha flight controls, but whatever. Um, so choose alpha flight controls. You know, move the roll and assign that to roll. Move the pitch, assign it to pitch. Uh, for the master switch, you have the so-called alternator. That needs to be assigned to generator in X-Plane. X-Plane doesn't have an alternator function. It only has a generator function. So assign that to generator. Uh, then the next one, of course, is battery, just like you would think. The avionics, uh, assigned to avionics on and off. Uh, avionics bus two, I just have it assigned to none right now because we're flying a Cessna 172, but you can assign to whatever you want. And then, of course, all the lights. Beacon, landing, taxi, nav, and strobe. The feel of the switches here is almost, not quite, but almost as good as the feel of the switches in my actual Lance Air. Um, just that heavy, solid, no nonsense. It's on or it's off. There's no in between and it only moves in one direction, the direction you flip it. It doesn't wiggle around or anything like that. It comes up over a detent with a sharp snap, pops into position. There's no doubt about where it is. Uh, these are what makes uh, a button have a good solid feel. You absolutely want that in the real airplane and we also get it in the sim. Boy, oh, 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 oh. That was the I Dream of Genie. I just made something happen. So here it is. This is the next day. Okay, it's 24 hours later. Yes, I'm wearing the same shirt. I do that sometimes. I smell bad. I don't care. So uh, it's 24 hours later 
and we did some cool stuff over the last 24 hours at Laminar Research. So last night I went home and programmed the A and B trim systems. And Tyler recently programmed this yoke to show up in joystick settings so it's already pre-configured. So two of the cool stuff that we were talking about doing 24 hours ago is now done. So let's go over here to joystick settings. This is in this cool. Now with 1140 beta 2, and this is what you're looking at. You're looking at 1140 beta 2, and uh, it's not online at the moment I'm recording this video, but it probably will be online by the time you are watching this video. Um, oh, and if you want to get the latest X-Plane beta, go to austinmeyer.com, austinmeyer.com. And I have a little section in the upper left for X-Plane, and there'll be a little link to where you can download the secret beta. But you and, first have to be running the first public beta. Of right, the public which will all be explained at austinmeyer.com. If you just go to austinmeyer.com, secret, or to the, to the section in the upper left where I say go here for the secret beta which admittedly is not that secret but it's outside of the X-Plane ecosystem which just about makes it secret for a lot of people but um if you get 1140 beta 2 then you will see this so isn't this awesome uh alpha flight controls you can actually um Tyler, it looks like did an amazing job of doing the UI where you can actually uh, see what the switches are and like assign them to things. Just flip one of the switches on the switch. Button. Oh yeah, and this is even better when you start flipping the switches at the bottom. Now we we did the configuration of this yoke yesterday, right? With yesterday's video. Okay. Well, I'm not going to bore you all with doing it again. But now with 1140 uh, X Plane 1140 Beta 2, it's done with pictures. All right. And so now let me show you the new A B trim that I was talking about yesterday and I coded last night. So on this switch here, just to sign this little switch, and hopefully Mike's camera will get this, the left up, we don't want that to be pitch trimmed down. Oh no, we're gonna type in trim as a search. We want this to be pitch trim A down, apply, boom. We don't want it to be pitch up, we want it to be pitch trim A up. And then the left one, oh no, it's not nothing, it's pitch trim B down, and then pull this for a trim up, and this is pitch trim B up. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm doing, Mike? You can follow yeah. this, right? It's easy yeah. as hell. It's pitch trim A up and down, pitch trim B up and down. And, and so, I, you, so to do the pitch trim up, then you're gonna have to push A and B simultaneously. Just like the real plane. Let's give it a try. Let's see if it works. So I'm gonna use my little hat switch here. We're gonna take a look at the trim. Now I'm just gonna move to A. Oh no, nothing's happening. How about just the B? Oh no, it's broken. Now I'm moving both together. Ba -ba -da, da -da -da. We got trim. Wow. So in other words, uh, these guys did a cool ass job on their hardware, so I'm matching them in software, folks. That's how it's done. So um, we've got uh, the A and B uh, trim. Both had to be pressed at the same time to trim the plane. Pitch, axis. Yeah, that's correct. You know, I did a little Googling. I can't find that real airplanes have this so often in roll. I mean, you remember what we talked about yesterday. If the trim runs away, it's not the end of the world. You can usually overpower it, except pitch trim down. Because as the airplane goes down, the speed builds up so much, the aerodynamic forces rapidly run away from the pilot's ability to fly it. So it's really only the pitch trim down that you need to be like hyper paranoid about. Um, and that's why this whole thing seems a little odd to me, because I don't recall seeing this in an airplane. Now in the comments, we're gonna find like the one guy that flew the SR-71 in 1965 and said, oh yeah, well the C model had a dual roll trim. You know, great, great, love it. Can't wait to read the comments and find out about it. But uh, for all the airplanes I've flown, it's only really been the pitch where they're hyper paranoid about a runaway. Um, Okay, there's no rudder pedals, so the rudder pedals auto-calibrate to the ailerons, just as they always do. <laughs> All right, Mike's laughing because he had a little screw up with that yesterday. But okay, so let's go. Let's see if I can figure out how to start a Cessna 172 here. So we're going to go battery. I'm going to move the uh, cockpit uh, view around a little so we can see. So we're going to go battery on. Beep. Then we're going to go beacon, nav, and strobe on. We turn them on here, and we see them move here. Um which some people do before they start their engine. And I'm gonna turn the key, 
dee, 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 vroom. Okay, I'm making the sound myself because I have the audio turned off here, so the airplane noise isn't competing with me for this video. But the sound in the actual Cessna 172 is freaking insanely good. Uh, you, I mean, you, you might notice, Mike, haven't you? How awesome oh, the sound yeah. is in the 172. Well, after you know the version 10 was. So yeah, good. yeah, lame. <laughs> right. Yeah. So our 172 sound is awesome. Oh, we have actually hired a new person at Laminar Research, uh, Daniela uh, Rodriguez. I want to say is her last name. I think she's from like Brazil or something, and she is an app, uh, just a sound guru, a sound like nut job. Uh, not in a good way, of course, which is why she's with us. And uh, so she's upgrading the sounds in our airplanes one at a time so that all of our sounds for all of our airplanes ultimately become as good as what we see here in the Cessna 172, which will happen over time. And she was literally, she found a McDonnell Douglas MD-80 in an aviation museum, and she convinced the uh, museum to let her like crawl all around the airplane, recording the sound of every switch, every flap handle, every little thing in the cockpit. Really? Yeah, so that when you flip switches in the MD-80 and X-plane, they'll have been recording the cockpit of an actual airplane. Now, as far as engine and auxiliary power unit and stuff like that, she might either uh, record that at the airport from one that's actually running, and or synthesize it with uh, computer synthesis. But either way... You tried way, to do that with your Ferrari one time. Oh, yeah. You how hard that was. Right? Oh, it's impossible because you can't hold the engine at a constant, you know, pitch or a constant RPM. Although, as always, and make the disclaimer I always make, I've switched from Ferrari to Tesla. Um, but I've, I've been told not to go on and off forever about that or it'll uh, annoy and bore people. So, um... Okay, so let's see if we can get back to running an airplane. Oh yes, I was just making the engine noises myself and I got sidetracked by Daniela. Okay, so uh, do, 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 do. let's turn on the rest of our lights. Oh, probably had to turn on our alternator and our avionics. There we go. So again, the switches have a great feel. I've just started up the airplane. It's an absolute piece of cake. It feels sort of like starting a real airplane. Let's turn off the brakes. Now, Mike, how do you think I should advance the power since these guys don't make a throttle quadrant yet? I'm just going to go, use the keyboard what is right it, now. function F2. What's so my the... suggestion for someone getting this for right now, as, as we talked about earlier, would be to get a Logitech uh, throttle for $59 until, you know, the one that uh, comes out from um, Alpha or whatever. I forget what mm. they call it, but um, they're going to yeah. come out with a throttle after the first of the year, I believe. Oh. It wasn't pulling to the left, was it? <laughs> it's pulling up pretty hard, as real airplanes do, of course, if they have a single inch propeller turning clockwise in front. Oh, it's as good as they say. <laughs> it's uh, the yoke. It's it's linear, and the motions are smooth. We don't have that bleh, bleh feeling that you get so often because the deflection of the yoke is large. Well, the, the medium Logitech, deflections are very, very modest. On the Logitech, the same amount of deflection is going to give you twice the amount yeah. of input because it's got right. uh, only a... It only goes, it only goes through far, 30, yeah. freaking 30 or 40 degrees of travel. But here, because you have 90 degrees of travel, the inner part is, is just so precise. It makes the airplane feel less twitchy or unstable you know that's what people always or if it makes your plane feel less sensitive a common complaint about x-plane is oh it feels too sensitive well part of that was addressed by my delayed downwash over the tail that i talked about in my 1140 flight model video and uh part of that is there is no travel in the freaking yoke now the the flight model issue has been solved as you'll see in my 1140 flight model video and maybe michael toss a link to that video in the description or something like that and uh the, the honeycomb guys have also solved the problem of uh, the yoke being uh, too sensitive with too small a travel without enough resistance. Because the pitch on this yoke, oh yeah, it's absolutely as easy as the pitch in the actual airplane. For the, I'd say possibly for the first time in X-Plane ever in my life, I actually feel like the control interface to the aircraft is so good that it feels like a real plane. I'd say this, literally this moment is the first time I've ever truly felt this. And I was looking carefully at the uh, elevator deflections as I move this thing and the data output. And this thing is absolutely the, sending an input that's down to one. Is yeah, the resolution of the stick, you can see in the elevator data output, you know, you go to data output in X plane, select elevator, and you can see that the elevator output is absolutely coming in down to this is in this is the thousands. It's uh, it goes from triple O two to 
0013, that's one part in a thousand. Yeah, it's operating in thousandths. This thing is not down to uh, byte level discretion, which is one in 256 or one in 512. It's uh, twice the res of that or four times the res of that. We're, our resolution is down to parts in a thousand, to one part in a thousand. And as I'm sitting here flying this airplane, it's as easy as flying a real airplane on a perfectly calm day where the airplane is perfectly smooth, perfectly quiet, the airplane is perfectly smooth, which you never see, ever. And so this is actually easier than flying a real airplane because the atmosphere is so smooth. And that's a first. Simulators are almost always harder to fly than the real airplane, largely because the, the joystick is too fidgety and, and does too much with too little motion. But Honeycomb has solved that problem. And now the simulator is easier to fly than the real airplane because we've got the mathematically perfect air. And the good news is there's a few things easier in X-Plane than making the air move, right? So why don't we do that? Let's, we, we've shown the sim is too easy, so let's, uh, let's make it not. Uh, let's go for a wind layer. Yeah, we're gonna go for, you know, wind, oh, let's say 10 knots, a little mild turbulence. Eh, give it about, yeah, four knots of gust. So this, let's make it a little less than 10 knots. Let's make it uh, eh, about seven knots, gust increase four, mild, mild turbulence. This is basically a day that, oh, you can, can you see the yeah. airplane? So this is more like a day that you find, say, in the southeast in the summertime, where there's some motion in the air. And then, of course, uh, kind of a cool little thing to do, same as always. What is it? Shift M? No, it's not. Control M. Thank you. Oh, let's make it uh, a, little, a little more like nighttime here so we can kind of see the forces. And so now you can really see how uh, we're moving through this, uh, you know, ever moving air. Uh, and you can see, obviously, the lift on the wing, the fuselage, even the little uh, outriggers here are picking up uh, some lift. Ditto the tail. Uh, you can even see a slight little variation in the prop. Oh, and here's an interesting thing. An 844 X-ray, my evolution, I can absolutely feel wind in the longitudinal axis because my prop catches it. See, my airplane has this gigantic, huge prop, but it doesn't weigh anything. So it's just a carbon fiber bubble with a little aluminum tube for an engine in front. So my airplane is a gigantic prop, but weighs nothing. And so in my airplane, you really feel these thrust vectors coming fore and aft as you go into more and less headwind and the prop does more or less. Now this is a little more action I think than we really want. So let's, I'm gonna go uh, take out the turbulence or most of the turbulence. Let's see, I'm not sure exactly how Tyler has the, oh, there we go, okay. So now I just made less turbulence, but still there's that little four knot variation, I guess. There seemed to be a lot of randomness in the turbulence. It seemed to be right. more of a, an oscillation. Because the turbulence wave is bigger than the size of the airplane. So you see the whole airplane is in it or the whole airplane isn't, you see? So it does vary across the airplane, but the turbulence waves are big enough, you don't really notice it. If we'd been in a 747, for example, you would have seen, uh, a little more variation from wingtip to wingtip, you see, as you know, one part of the wing is in the downdraft while the other part is in the updraft. Okay, so let's go ahead and see if I can get this thing on the ground. Let's see how it feels for landing. Do a little do like, okay, so now I'm gonna say function F1 to uh, bring the throttle back. I guess we'll get in the cockpit here. Oh, there we go. I didn't even know this thing could go 130 knots. Trim it on down. Okay. Kind of the nice X-plane scenery there. Nice X-plane night scenery. Make it daytime again. The nighttime's not picking up all that great on the. Oh, the night. Okay, fine. We'll make it day. Nighttime is so much more beautiful to me. So much more beautiful. But if you want it day, we'll do day. Okay. Does the camera pick this up? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it'd be even better if it was like really daytime. I mean, that's like dusk. I know it looks okay. better to you, but the camera's right. just not picking up the scenery all that well. Okay. Now, this is all I can do. This is it. This is daytime. Okay. Maybe the next thing we could do is turn up monitor brightness, but let's not mess with that right now. I don't feel like it. Okay. Uh, all right. We're 10 knots over flap extension. Uh, so why don't I just pretend I'm flying a real airplane here for a minute and just get this thing down to that 110 knots, I believe, is the first notch of flaps in the Skyhawk. Make the, make okay. The monitor show up a little better. Great. Oh, here's where I wish I had rudder pedals for a slip, but that's fine. All right. Yeah, for the first time, I just don't feel like the airplane is at all over-controlled in pitch. This yoke just makes all the difference. All the difference. 
So the, the one part in a thousand uh, resolution on the yoke with all the wonderful careful yoke uh, hardware uh, and X-Plane's delayed downwash on the tail to stabilize the airplane. And again, Mike, when you publish the video, make sure you have a link to the flight model video so people can see what I'm talking about. Um, it just makes it an absolute pleasure. Okay. All right. Now, this is where I wish I could go for a throttle to get over the uh, extended threshold here. All right, but I can't get to throttle because Honeycomb doesn't make a throttle yet, so I touched on a little short. Okay, so uh, if Honeycomb had made a throttle, I would have added a little power there and not touched down on the extended threshold, which they will, and we get that in 2020. So there you go. That's the video.